Hello, I'm Nadine Blaney. Welcome to Media Week. Ahead on the program, merger moves, Fairfax and APN News and Media in exclusive talks about a potential tie-up of their New Zealand operations. We'll recap the winners from the TV Week Logie Awards, including Walid Ali taking out the top gong. Don't adjust your sets. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with the picture. And the television industry pays tribute to Reg Grundy, one of the most successful Australian producers in the business. Our co-host, James Manning, editor and publisher of Media Week, is here, of course, to take us through all of those stories and more. First, though, industry body, the Newspaper Works, has rebranded itself as News Media Works to reflect the diverse verticals of news publications of its members. Now, the move comes as the organization announced what it called a world-first partnership with Standard Media Index, or SMI, for a quarterly report called News Media Index. The report will reveal the advertising revenue for the publishing industry, broken down this time into print, digital, and newspaper-inserted magazines. And joining us to talk about the rebrand and the ad revenue insights, of course, that will be provided is the chief executive of News Media Work, Mark Hollins. Mark, welcome to the program. Thanks very much, Nadine. Um, does dropping the word newspaper from your title put a little bit of distance between print and yourselves, I guess, considering the declines that we're seeing in the print sector? No, I don't think it puts distance. I think it actually gets us close to our digital future. Um, newspapers are still a very important part, as the numbers would suggest in the SMI index. Uh, it's still around about 75 to 80 percent of our revenues. Uh, but we know where our future is. We know where our clients are thinking also. And so we're really trying to balance the portfolio. So this is coming along with the whole digital revolution and really speaking to what your members do. Yeah. I, I mean, innovation is, has become really a mantra for newspaper publishers, and it's, it's underpinned by our newspapers and the revenues out of our newspapers, but we have to build for the future and, and meet market need, audience need, and advertiser need. Mm -hmm. Is uh, what more than a name change is it though in terms of how you operate the business? Will you be doing new things you haven't done before? Um... Yeah, I think that uh, just from a sort of an, an internal perspective, uh, we need to up our digital skills, we need to operate a little bit more in what we call areas of non-competitive operations to help the publishers be more uh, profitable by sharing resources and so forth and that's, that's part of where, where we see our future. And have you had to bring in new team members to help achieve that and help bring in those specialised areas of expertise? Well, actually, we're, we're pretty blessed. If you look across our team, uh, ad agency person, TV person, radio person, old newspaper guy like myself, I mean, there's got a lot of, lot of skills in the, in the room anyway. So from that perspective, I think that we are, we're, we're kind of well positioned for the future. To me, it seems like there's almost two messages I get from the newspaper publishers. I mean, on one hand, some people, and, and I get this feeling at times too, that they're not genuinely trying to support print. Um, so I'd like to get your thought on that. And then there's another train of thought that people say, well, why would they? They'd be crazy to support print. So is that a sort of line they have to... Well, I think, firstly, I think they do support print. I think that some of the narrative, certainly that comes out of uh, the newsrooms, might question it, and that's, that's completely up to the, up to the journalists. I think their, their job is to question uh, everybody and everything, including their own industry, so no problem with that. And I, but equally, I think that as an industry, we're certainly very supportive of print and it as a, as a future business model. As you, you know, as you see from the SMI in numbers, I mean, print still is a massive part of the business. Yeah. Well, just on that SMI data, I mean, the SMI has been in the past linked with tracking revenue just from media agencies. Yeah. Will that change in terms of the revenue they'll be revealing about newspapers? No. Or will it be just agency dollars? Well, they will be. Um, they will continue their relationship with the media agencies, um, but the, the the media agency revenues that we see that relate to print are only media agency bookings right. and don't reflect the 50 plus percent of our direct business. So, so we will see that in this new yeah, data? Yeah, you do see that in this new data because we don't pull the numbers out of media agencies for this index. We actually pull them straight out of the financial systems of our newspaper publishers. So whoever books, wherever they're from, 
that'll turn up in That's the That's right. If it's in the publisher system, then it will be reflected in the SMI index. And then just one more fine point on the, yeah. the revenues. Newspaper digital revenues, I think, in the past have been lumped in with digital ad spend. That's right. Will that continue to happen? And No, well, we'll break them out. But I think what you've seen in SMI is where they have spoken about the growth of digital, 30% of that growth comes from newspaper publishers. So if you look at, if you set aside Google and Facebook, the media content owners uh, sort of league table of who's booking most business is owned by News Corp, Fairfax and Seven West Media. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the, um, the chairman of Michael, chairman of your chairman, uh, Michael Miller, now the chief executive of News Corp, he talked about that $2.4 billion. Um, if you add the circulation revenues to that, you're talking about a pretty you know, a, yeah. a large amount of money, which you would think would be a could support a good industry, uh, but it's on the decline. What I'm wondering is, how far has it got to go? Can can you slip much further and still have maintain your current levels, or well, have you got a point where you think you know, okay? Well, no, I, I think the I think you're right about the strength of the revenues because if I mean in Melbourne alone, that would be half a million dollars every day. The Age and the Herald Sun. And so from that perspective, if you add that across all the metro markets and the regional markets, that's an awful lot of revenue that is coming in on top of the $2.4 billion. And it does support a great industry and it will continue to. And it certainly allows the publishers to spend money on innovation that is geared for their future. Uh, two of your members, APN News and Media and Fairfax, of course, are talking about consolidating and merging their yeah. business in New Zealand. Um, James and I will be speaking about that in detail a little bit later in the program. But I guess taking it from an Australian perspective, do you see that there's any chances of any such tie-ups or mergers happening in Australia? Well, different market. I mean, the, mag the size of the market is, is a magnitude bigger than New Zealand. I actually think that this is good news um, in New Zealand. There's no point in two companies fighting over uh, a market when Facebook and Google are doing in New Zealand what they do internationally in every market. Uh, I think it's an, actually an, it's an excellent move. I hope that it works out from clearly uh, putting NZME um, and uh, putting that onto um, onto the stock exchange and going to the Commerce Commission to talk ultimately about merging with Fairfax New Zealand is I think very positive for the market and it will ensure a strong newspaper and news driven, journalistically driven um, product set for the Kiwis. That um, Robert Thompson last week in the News Corp results talked about advertisers probably underestimating their market. Publishers here seem to have gone soft on sort of criticising advertisers. You can understand why you don't want to disengage your, your, some of your, your big spenders, yep. but but in general, have a lot of advertisers bailed out too quickly from the trade, maybe print and in some digital opportunities? Yeah, I think so. Um, yes, I do. I think that they might want to reconsider. I think that to uh, your reference about sort of general market narratives, that was one of the reasons why we actually work with SMIs to uh, kind of address the perception of a uh, of a of a fast declining market. I mean, it's tough, but we're in a sort a transformation period and our digital revenues for example are nearly 20 percent year-on-year growth and so and overall our overall revenues from an industry perspective in Q1 of this of this year are, are down five percent so from that perspective that doesn't really match the narrative that is being put out in the market and I think most advertisers will be sensible enough to come back and reevaluate. Mm. yeah interesting um, News Media Works is putting out weekly audience insights. There's some really great tidbits of information in there. But everything that you do is about audience engagement and behavior around new products. So it's a, it's a big question. But, you know, talk to us about some of the themes that we'll be seeing uh, in the markets that you're moving in the, in the next year or so. Well, mobile. Mm -hmm. Video, big things, big things for publishers. Certainly, as telecommunications companies actually give us more data to play with on our mobile phone, you're going to see um, you're going to see more usage of video, and there's a lot of investment coming into that. And certainly, the insights you're referring to are we looking at our readers as consumers, and what are they, where do they expect to spend their money in the in the year coming ahead? And still, you know, our biggest audience is still print. 
Um, and even after 20 years of, of the internet being on a desktop computer, it's still print. But equally, we're seeing a very, very fast growth in the mobile. And I think that's really where the action's going to be. And I think also the publishers will underpin that with the desktop solution and, of course, print, which is, you know, ultimately kind of where we get the biggest of our quality audiences. Mark Collins, CEO of News Media Works, thanks so much for joining us. Pleasure. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate it. Well, moving along, and uh, one of the themes that we were talking about just then was, of course, uh, the fact that we are looking at the big discussions going on between APN News and Media and Fairfax about a potential tie-up between their New Zealand businesses as APN looks to demerge its uh, New Zealand business. So let's get the, the scene set from Ben Lebrun from Options Express from a market perspective. Well, all the talk this week has been on the proposed merger between APN News and Media and of course Fairfax as well with their New Zealand operations potentially coming together. Uh, the market has had a chance to react to, to Fairfax. Uh, that's seen a jump up in their share price. APN News and Media is still in trading halt until the 13th of May until we get details of their entitlement offer and the institutional component thereof. So it's expected APN will be uh, quite positive when they come back online as well on this New Zealand tie-up, which is potentially going to unlock a, a lot of synergies. It'll remove a lot of overlap in that New Zealand market and give the merged entity a, a, a chance to, to really focus on tying up and, and, and shoring up uh, New Zealand advertising revenues. Now, the ramifications uh, for Fairfax uh, are quite broad because uh, focusing back in Australia, if this is a successful demerger of their New Zealand operations, we might see them undertake something similar with some of their publishing assets, some of their regional publishing assets, if they can find uh, someone to, to merge those assets with, that might take shape in Australia as well. That would leave a very streamlined Fairfax business uh, and talk about about being able to unlock value that have the, the metropolitan publishing assets, which of course have, have struggled a little bit. But in terms of the, the best offering or the jewel in the crown at the moment is domain. So uh, certainly Fairfax and APN would uh, it'd certainly give uh, shore up their balance sheets and any cross media ship owner, uh, ownership laws, uh, if they're going to change in the not too distant future, if M&A is very much a, a part of the reality in the media sector, then certainly Fairfax at least would be able to participate and certainly start to bid for uh, any assets that became available. Well, let's bring in our guest host, or co-host, I should say, James Manning from Media Week. So let's just talk about this. Uh, Credit Suisse says that uh, this demerger and potential merger with uh, the APN business in New Zealand could be a first step to Fairfax offloading some of its publishing assets, that it could be, you know, the sign of more to come, and it's flagging the Australian community media operations as a potential area that it could uh, sever from. What, what's your sort of inside thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I, I guess it could do that. I, I'm not sure what it what it does. I mean, is that free up some capital or something? Mm -hmm. You know, free up some capital, um, share buybacks, reinvestment in domain. Yeah, pay down some debt. I don't know if they, they're carrying much, but um, yeah, look, it could be an idea. It was it was good this week though. Greg Highwood did come out and say he was questioned pretty closely about the where's the company going, what's its core business, and he still thinks it's the journalism is still their biggest asset. You know, yeah. so he still sees they they're going to continue to focus on that. He thinks, look, um, real estate income via domain is nice, and he said look, we've always had that, except we used to get it in classifieds, in print. Now we're getting that same revenue stream, but as a, um, as a digital. It, it sounds, you know, very positive, but it sounds as if his positive words are falling on deaf ears when it comes to, you know, the employees, backdrop yeah. of more redundancies, a vote of no confidence coming from, from employees in Mr. Highwood. Yeah, I don't think they've been happy for a long time, you know, and you can understand that. It's, um, it's a tough... It's a tough industry at the moment, isn't it, you know? Um, and, uh, you know, Mr Highwood would argue, as he's told us on the show recently, you know, they're navigating it through as best they can, you know, doing what they think's right. You know, they think they need to cut back those staff numbers to, for, for what the audience wants. You know, they think they're overstaffed. They can do a, a little bit better on that. Yeah. Uh, let's turn away from Fairfax, though. Talk about Foxtel CEO Peter Tonner saying, um, look, when it comes to the chance of a 10 takeover, what's the point? Yeah, look, they've already they're on the the share register there, so they've got a seat at the table. They've got a person on the board, you know. I thought it was also interesting that he said that it was going to potentially it could potentially complicate some of the relationships that Foxtel has with you know the likes of of Nine and Fox Sports. Yeah, and I think um, Presto they've got a JV with Seven, you know, which is their their Asphod play. So yeah, again, that, that seems to make sense. Look, it's been speculated for years that look, News Corp 
could move in and just take over ten, but they've never really moved on it. Um, there's been competition concerns and stuff like that, of course. But you, you get the feeling if they would have, if they wanted to do it, they probably would have had a crack by now. Um, Nine CEO Hugh Marks out also talking up Stan and actually looking to, I think, break even or be positive cash flow by. Um, 2018 and, and forecasting some pretty good growth in subscribers as well. Yes, yeah, so that's just over three years after our mm. launch. I think the initial talk might have been, look, it might take us five years to break even. So if they could get there in three, that's a, that's a pretty good deal. They've got uh, half a million, they've crossed the line, I think half a million paying subscribers at the moment. Just exactly who's a subscriber, I'm not sure how they count that, but at least someone at some stage just paid some money. Mm -hmm. People who've sampled the service is now close to a million. So it's people who maybe that includes people who've used their free trials. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's doing very well. They've got their pro, their series Wolf Creek was released this week. Um, some original content they commissioned. So you could, I think they'll have a really bumper May. You know, yeah, it'll, it'll be interesting to see how that goes. There's Absolutely. plenty of advertising around for it. Um, Reg Grundy, we should talk about him, known for, well, so much in the Australian TV industry. I guess what would you remember him most for? Oh, probably the, the game shows, I guess, you know. Um, I didn't realise Wheel of Fortune was his creation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were talking about that this morning. He certainly had a lot to do with that, with sort of taking it around the world. And that was one of his successes, I think, sort of franchising game shows and just plonking them in markets everywhere. Um, Neighbours, I guess, is another one, you know, a sort of staple of the Australian TV scene. Still going uh, reasonably strong here, still very strong in the UK, mm -hmm. you know. So, yeah, that, that, that's his big thought. Look, he hasn't been here for a long time, of course. So, you know, he, he was in Bermuda, he's been Bermuda. living there. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, you know, hasn't been active for a long time, but he's his legacy remains and um, a lot of those programs of course still successful. Okay, we're taking a short break but coming up on Media Week we'll take you through the big winners from the Logie Awards. Stay with us. Music is my life. From the director of Philomena and the Queen. She can't be a little flat. Flat. <laughs> Just a comes an inspiring true story. Meryl Streep, Hugh Grant. They're going to love you. Florence Foster Jenkins. Have you ever looked for a hotel online? Well, Trivago does the work for you and instantly compares the prices of over 600,000 hotels from over 200 different websites. That's how you can be sure that you find the ideal hotel for the best price. Hotel Trivago. Investing in a DHA property means guaranteed rent for up to 12 years. DHA is backed by the Australian Government, so it's secure. We'll look after your rent, tenants and day-to-day -day maintenance. Sit back and look forward to tomorrow. Visit dha.gov.au slash look forward. Black out the light Maybe you're tired From A stone cold You fumble and fight With all the time Spend on Cause it's only fair Help change a child's life Donate today at childfund.org.au Or call 1-800-869934 Because every child needs a childhood Freedom is not a crown worn lightly. It weighs heavy with responsibility for those of us who are fortunate enough to wear it. He runs from the Chinese embassy and ends up dead by the lake. Aren't you interested? Everything here points to an agency covering up. We cannot meet, we cannot speak, we cannot have any contact. This is a serious warning. Behind the closed doors of Canberra, who's really running the country? Political graveyards are full of people who are loyal to idiots. An all-star Australian and international cast. Remember when I said we had to be prepared for anything? Well, things are about to get very, very ugly. Secret City begins Sunday, June 5 on Showcase. Find Showcase in the Drama Pack.
He's the political warrior who was a permanent campaigner for four years, but the former Prime Minister has hardly been seen this time. What role will he play in this long campaign? And beyond the election, Tony Abbott joins me for Viewpoint Sunday on Sky News Live. Welcome back to Media Week. Our co-host James Manning, editor and publisher of Media Week, is here with me. So James, how about we run through some of the uh, listings and ratings for Let's this is it. free to air week 19. And taking a look, you can see that uh, the voice certainly hasn't lost any of its luster as we move through these ones. It's uh, not just number one, but also number two and shows up down the list as well. Yeah, look, nine having a great week. and. Um filling four of the top five spots, you know, a few weeks ago, if you'd said nine will be back back up there so quickly, you would have said, yeah, sure, you sure? But there, they've recovered really nicely off the back of the voice. You can't forget MasterChef, of course. Yeah, no, MasterChef, I think that's, uh, so three in the top ten is really good, and I think it's the first time we've probably seen ten in the top ten for quite some time. Uh, Kitty Flanagan's piece at the Logies on MasterChef when she was <laughs> presenting the award was pretty, pretty good. Um, yeah, talking about, you could go to TAFE if you really want to be a chef, yeah. but I digress. Yeah. Um, this is um, subscription TV ratings, and, you know, we separated it to sport and, yeah, yeah, and everything else for a good yeah. reason. Uh, two AFL, two NRL and the last A-League game of the season, the final, squeezing into the top five there on all those games on uh, Fox Sports. Or... Let's take a look at non-sport and Game of Thrones. I guess we can look forward to seeing that topping the list. Yeah, look, that'll be here, I think, till the rest of the season. We sort of, uh, this will be ratings for the second episode, I think. Uh, Foxtel updated us. They said for the total audience for watching that first week was 1.2 million when you're taking that consolidated seven-day viewing. Mm -hmm. So it's set a real high, you know, a, a new benchmark for subscription TV in Australia. So, yeah, did very well. Gogglebox Australia taking best factual program yep. at the TV Logies. It took some by surprise. Yeah, it did a little bit, mainly because maybe the category it was in. Well, it was against Best Australian factual. Story. And... For sure, yeah. So, but, I mean, we spoke to TV Week this week after Logies, and that was one of the things, yeah, look, it's, it's often hard to work out where to put a program. Maybe that's something I'll review for the future. Yeah, but um, I've said it once, I'll say it again. I really enjoy the program. Very endearing, very yeah, endearing pretty, people. Very funny. So what was the sort of takeaway from the TV logies? I mean, was there one, obviously it garnered a lot of headlines for memorable speeches, but yeah, was there look, one network that sort of ended up on top? Yeah, well, I'm probably at the, in terms of award winners, ABC and 10, were the big winners, 15 awards between them. I think ABC had eight, uh, 10 had seven, nine and seven had seven between them. I think nine had four, seven, or seven, whatever, they shared seven. And uh, SBS and Foxtel got a couple. So the, every, everyone was recognised. The, the production companies are good spread. I think 12 separate production companies had shows up that got awards with um, Rove McManus's production company, Roving Enterprises, mm -hmm. the big winner there because of. Um, uh, the project, the show they make for 10. Mm -hmm. And of course the project was the biggest single winner with three awards, so Wally Daly winning two and the program winning one for itself. So 10 had a really good night, but they're just right across the industry. I mean, there were no big international stars this year. There was no big international singing artists. So it was, a, it was really sort of Australia at its best, if you like, and just celebrating the local industry. And, it, and it, the feedback's been fantastic. Yeah, any sort of ratings? From it, do we yeah. know how many people were watching? Yeah, look, it did uh, over a million viewers. I think it was up very slightly on last year. So again, that's great for a program that ran for you know four hours. It's yeah, pretty well, I was going to say I watched right? you know I watched parts of it, but I had to, yeah. to go to bed. But yeah, it was yeah, a, it was a good show. Sunday night, you know, it was four hours. So to get those sort of numbers, it's pretty amazing. So. Um, let's keep talking TV because Nine has revealed how they plan to take on MKR next year. What's their best shot? Yeah, it's going to be called Married at First Sight. Uh, it's a program we they slipped it back into the schedule when they didn't go so well at the start of the year. It's a program they usually run once or twice a week. They've um, been producing it themselves for the last two seasons, I think. So they've gone to uh, Sh Endemol Shine, which is the yeah. Fantasy Brothers, who are sort of the specialists at big budget, you know, stripped programs across the week. They're going to supercharge the format. That'll be back in. Uh, probably the first or second week of February next year. They'll try to take My Kitchen Rules on 
uh, head first. I think the reason they want to get it out into the market now is to make a statement to their advertisers, look, you know, we, we're not happy with, you know, coming a distant second uh, at the start of every year, so we're really going to compete hard mm -hmm. next year. Um, also, Nine revealing who's going to be playing Alan Bond in House of Bond. Yeah, it looks going to be Ben Mingay is going to be Alan Bond, so it's something I'm really looking forward to this. Uh, CJZ, the people um, who made uh, the Gina Reinhardt um, uh, miniseries last year, and we're still actually in court with her over that too, but they're a bit happier that Alan Bond won't be able to sue them, you know, because making a show about someone no longer with us is a, is a lot easier than someone who's still alive. It's, uh, and when is that due? Um, nine were talking about the last quarter of 2016. I'm not sure how far advanced it is, and I think Nine have got some flexibility whether they can, they need to slot it in this year or perhaps they want to save it to really give them that uh, big start next year and maybe throw it up again against a couple of Sunday nights at My Kitchen mm. Rules early in 27. Yeah, interesting. Um, just time for one more. Australian Survivor in Samoa. Yeah, look, the um, 55 days of the shoot's going to be, which is one of the longest in the world. So we're going to get a lot of episodes, I think, of the show when it turns up on the schedule. The producers and everybody leave this weekend. They start filming on Monday. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I'm really looking forward to it. Jonathan Lapali is going to be the host. Oh, really? 24 contestants. We're not sure how much prize money they'll be, they'll be you know, competing with, but I, I'm led to believe it's big enough to make them all want to compete very hard. So. Well, we'll be watching out for that one. James, yeah, always a pleasure. Good. Thanks for coming thanks, in. Nadine. James Manning there. That's all we have time for, but from all the team here, thanks for your company.